What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 236 at block height 647,034 on Sunday, September 6th. So what is up, Janine? Well, um, I'm sure probably the listeners understand why the next week is going to be insane, uh, in particular. Uh, There will be a lot of Assange updates next week. Hopefully good ones. Yep, I guess that will all depend on whether the UK manages to uh, retain some of the justice it claims to have. Well, I mean... In other news, people are arguing about the name of lists on GitHub. Okay, so we have to get into this. Uh, That was... An incredibly stupid situation, um, and this whole thing is stupid and silly. But despite the fact that it is a air quote meaningless uh, variable name change, I do not like the idea that like three or four devs just axed something, pushed it, and um, just tried to sweep it under the rug. Because the entire dynamic was just social pressure of bad thing. And they just immediately cave to it. And this is such an insignificant, tiny little thing. But it bothers me that they cave to that. Especially given that there have been similar pull requests in the past that were just ignored or closed. Yeah, I mean, the one... Uh... Kind of just clipped out there for a second. Uh, I mean... I don't know why that is. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, I just feel like, you know, every time you make changes to code, there is the chance that something can go wrong. And with something like this, I don't know if if it's worth taking that risk, however small it may be, plus generating a controversy that doesn't really need to be had. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like we have there are much more important things to deal with than this, but whatever the change that people are arguing about has already been made. It was made like what a month ago, two months ago. So I don't know why this brought got brought up again, but I don't care. Well, it's just the fact that like social pressure led to a very small group of devs pushing something through. And it's just a name, but it's, it's literally social pressure. If you can't stand up to a suggestion to change variable names because they're air quote offensive, then what what happens with more serious issues? You know, I find it offensive and socially irresponsible um, that this technology doesn't identify people. If they're going to cave over a word, what else are they going to cave over? But yeah. Another quick thing to mention before we get into stuff is uh, Peter Woola departing Blockstream for Chain Code Labs, which is uh, you know interesting, and I'm sure he's going to keep doing exactly the same stuff uh, he's doing over there. But uh, I can't help but wonder what was uh, the reason for the departure, because really his work at Blockstream had nothing to do with any of their products or you know, services they offer. He was just doing his normal Bitcoin thing. So uh, not really sure what's going on there, but I look forward to seeing him continue working um, employed in this space. So uh, Peter and some other people have dropped an improved version of uh, Musig. Um, 
dealing with some of the issues from the previous spec. So when you go to make a signature um, with a signature protocol, you have to select a random nonce in addition to, um, you know, performing the operation with the private key itself. And the issue here is that if you were to not have enough randomness in that nonce, or if you were to reuse that with two separate messages, um, mathematically, that pretty much allows you to reduce and sum things down to actually figure out the private key used for that. And how this is generally solved is using a deterministic nonce. Um, in Bitcoin, what you do is effectively hash the private key that you're signing with and the message, guaranteeing that part of the input is a secret no one else can get, and the other one commits uniquely to the exact message being signed. So this way, it's completely impossible um, to ever screw up and reuse the same notes with a different signature. But when you get into um, multi-party um, things like Musig, that introduces a problem because I could generate a nonce properly and then you could try to engage me twice to sign the same message and provide a, a different nonce on your end so that when that's combined into a single nonce for that signature, um, if you can get me to provide a signature with me using the same one each time um, and you provide something different, um, that boils down to the same thing where you can actually derive the private key. And in the original Musig spec, um, pretty much what they were going to do is implement a counter that would just iterate upwards um, as far as input for generating the nonce. But that creates the problem of tracking that index number. Um, so if you were to ever lose state or say recover from a backup or a very specific issue a lot of enterprises likely have to deal with, um, you were running stuff in a virtual machine that resets, um, then you could wind up reusing the nonce. And so pretty much what this new Musig um, deterministic nonce or DN scheme does is it effectively has everybody combine their public keys um, that are going to be involved in the multi-sig as well as an additional public key for each participant and then use this to generate the nonce and then um, pretty much they have completely um, created from scratch an entire new function to generate those nonces rather than just using a hash function as is conventionally done and this is a specific function designed to be succinct and efficient with zero knowledge proofs. So the idea here is now that you can use deterministic nonces with Musig. And when you go through this procedure to generate the nonce, you would also generate a zero knowledge proof to show that your nonce was generated properly with the input that everyone is supposed to be using. And everybody checks those proofs before you actually sign something. So in this way, you can kind of continue using deterministic nonces as is conventional, but not have to worry about the issue of state in terms of signing. So this is actually a, a really big improvement in terms of multi-sig constructs on Schnorr. And he uh, also, um, on the same day that he announced that he was block stream for chain code. Uh, he shared that the pull request for BIP uh, 340 uh, for Schnorr signatures is getting close to being merged very, very soon. Yeah, that's nice to see uh, the most recent changes uh, close to getting into libsec uh, P256K1. I don't think we actually covered that on the show when he made that proposal, but it was um, something to do with uh, the X, like deciding the um, to use the positive value or the negative value for one of the coordinates in a key, and they made a more um, 
what the hell was it? Pretty, pretty much they, they moved in one direction in terms of implementation that was a little more complex. And then after some further benchmarking tests, um, realized that the more efficient version to implement um, actually didn't have any performance hits versus what they did. So they kind of uh, wiggled that around uh, in the last minute. But, you know, it just goes to show uh, slow and steady because sometimes when you make assumptions in the design process, um, they don't always wind up being correct. And if you're uh, interested in kind of getting into the technical details or asking questions about it, um, the Bitcoin Core PR Review Club is still holding regular meetings to go over this stuff. And in fact, so far they've had, I think, five meetings that were just focused on Schnorr and Taproot stuff. Um, they had their last one on the 2nd of September, and um, I believe the next one is just going to be on Wednesday, because they hold them every Wednesday, I think. And yeah, so if you want to dig more into how Schnorr actually works and stuff, they always post the, um, they always post the questions that they're going to be looking into prior to the meeting, and then they post the change log, or the chat log after the meeting. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely something, um, you know, everybody should participate in if they're capable. So what is going on with a, uh, a certain nonprofit group uh, calling shenanigans? Yeah, so it was uh, quite interesting to have this because uh, this is definitely going to be coming in the Bitcoin privacy newsletter for this month. Um, but I did not realize actually that the Electronic Frontier Foundation has actually been um, pressuring some cryptocurrency exchanges and payment processors since I think 2018, June 2018, to release transparency reports. And so on September 2nd, um, she calls herself a legislative activist, Haley Sukayama, I think, um, published a call for Coinbase to, in particular, to start releasing regular transparency reports that provide insight into how many government requests for information it receives and how it deals with them. Um, and like I said, they wrote originally back in, I think it was actually July 2018? Um... In July 2018, they kind of just described what they would like these transparency reports to look like. Uh, and they basically just said, have it be an overview of how many government requests the company has received in a set period of time, such as a year. And optionally, it would be good if the companies could give other details, such as how many requests it actually complied with, how many accounts were affected, and any requests to censor or take down accounts as part of these requests. Uh, and she writes, financial data can be among the most sensitive types of information we produce. How you spend your money can reveal a lot about your daily habits, the causes you care about, who you hang out with, and where you go. Choosing to comply with or reject a government request for user data or choosing to shut down an account can have a huge impact on what types of speech can thrive online. And so the reason I wanted to definitely bring this up is not only is it a privacy issue, but in a previous newsletter, I looked at a case uh, U.S. v. Uh, v. Uh, Gretkowski, which was um, a case in Texas, I believe, where uh, they basically argued that the third party doctrine applies to cryptocurrency exchange accounts just as it does to banks. Um, and so the judges found that Gretkowski lacked a privacy interest in his Coinbase records, and so they were not subject to you know, they were not the type of data that would require a warrant, they would require a subpoena, which if you know how those kinds of legal requests work, a subpoena does not require probable cause. Um, so that's a lesser degree of proof that they have to submit to. And um, I was actually kind of, I mean, I don't, I haven't looked too much into the EFF's position on cryptocurrency stuff. They generally, from what I've seen, they tend to not be too interested in it. But it turns out that um, their special counsel, Marta Belcher, interesting enough, interestingly enough that a privacy-focused lawyer is also called Belcher, <laughs> uh, she actually disagreed with the government's use of the third-party doctrine. She said it's wrong, 
and that exchanges should be fighting for user privacy. She specifically said users should not lose the reasonable expectation of privacy in their data just because it is stored by a third party. In today's digital world, it is impossible to navigate daily life without using essential services like email that give third parties access to sensitive information. Now, the interesting, the really interesting part of this is, like I said, they've been pushing for payment processors in general to start publishing transparency reports since uh, at least around June 2018. Um, and when they made this call, uh, basically on the same day, uh, s someone reached out to Stripe and Stripe had said uh, basically on the day that they published this call that they would start doing that. And I haven't checked specifically whether Stripe has done so, but they did immediately respond and said that they intended to. Um, they also specifically mentioned in that call BitPay and Coinbase. Now, BitPay, I didn't see any kind of response or non-response from them on the issue, so I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming non-response. But Coinbase was reached out to, and they actually said that they had they would they had nothing to add they wouldn't say anything on the matter and since then um they have still not obviously released transparency reports which is why this story came up um then there is shapeshift shapeshift has published one report for the year of 2018 they have not published one for the last year 2019 so who knows whether they decided not to continue that practice um but something that the EFF highlighted was that Kraken has been publishing reports. Now, I want to be a little picky here because technically Kraken has not published reports per se. They have published snapshots, like visualizations of data from reports that they supposedly compiled for... You cut out. All right. What was the last thing you heard? Reports. Uh, can you be more specific? Uh, like compiling the reports. Uh, was I still talking about Kraken? Yeah, it was maybe like five, ten seconds. Uh, you cut out. Okay, so I'll I'll just start off with Kraken. Um, so then in the case of Kraken, um, I want to be a little picky here because um, the EFF highlighted them as having published transparency reports, and technically they kind of did. Um, they did publish snapshots from two reports for the year 2018 and 2019, and they showed, you know, how many government requests they received. I think they even, they broke it down into, like, the requests they received from particular countries. Um, so they did provide data, and it was useful. Um, the one thing I do find a little strange is that they didn't actually publish the report. They kind of just published a visualization of the report, which is still useful. And it's good to know. But um, I actually reached out to, uh, well, I I didn't reach out directly. I kind of used their little chat function. Um, and I asked, like, whether the reports were ever published. And the response I got was that they're not, but that they may be in the future. So, um, I mean, I still think it's good that Kraken gave numbers. But I just do want to be clear that they have not actually published the transparency reports. Which I find a, <laughs> it's I just find it a little funny because they are called transparency reports and they haven't been made transparent yet, and yeah, I mean there are many reasons why they wouldn't want to publish a full report. Maybe like obviously they there are reasons why they wouldn't want to re reveal details, but you can still publish some kind of document that you know even if you just want to rearrange the information that you gave in the snapshots, that would suffice. Um, but yeah, Coinbase uh, has not satisfied that request by the EFF in any way. So yeah, and it is concerning given that, um, as I've covered numerous times uh, on Block Digest and also in the newsletter, uh, Coinbase now has contractual relationships with the IRS and the Secret Service, um, and potentially the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration. Uh, that one we're not sure of yet. I would have to check again to see if... Um, I would have to check and see if that request has maybe popped up. It got for or forward shortly after people noticed it, so hard to tell whether it actually ended up getting accepted 
Um, but yeah, uh, Coinbase should be publishing reports. Yeah. Um, the day that happens, um, I'll buy stuff from BitPay merchants again. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the stuff with Kraken is just like silly. Like why, like just put it in a p like put the stuff they they've taken pictures of on Twitter in a report and and release it and it's a transparency report. Like people just want the info, the statistics. I find it ridiculously silly that they put that info out there, but say they have more detailed reports, but you can't just just call what you put out the report and release it as that. Like what? Yeah, yeah. Just silly semantics that make absolutely no sense to me. But like I said, we, at least in the case of Shapeshift and Kraken, have some numbers. Um, Coinbase hasn't even provided a justification for why they can't release the numbers. So, I mean, usually, like, there are a number of companies especially in the privacy and security space that publish regular transparency reports. And that is very important to people. And if, if one of them were to suddenly decide not to, or to not even give a reason for why they couldn't do that, a lot of people would freak out. Like that would basically uh, the, the assumption, because one of the things that the EFF mentions is that there's, you know, national security letters, which those um, I mean, a lot of people have fought to for have this um, to. Eh. A lot of people have fought to make this not the case, but um, you basically can't talk about the fact that you've received an NSL. Uh, so, the assumption usually, um, if if an organization can't say whether it's received a request, uh, like they can't even publish numbers on that, is that that sounds really bad. That sounds like they get a lot either get a lot of requests and they don't want people to know that or they get types of requests that they literally can't talk about and so the whole point of these transparency reports is to kind of you know put some of that fear down <laughs> and so the fact that coinbase has made no effort to do anything and they don't care that people care including the eff um that says a lot about them mm-hmm Alrighty. Ready for the next one? Yep. So Wasabi Wallet uh, on the 3rd of September disclosed a DDoS vulnerability on their coordinator. And apparently um, this was part of the uh, the upgrade on the back end that recently just happened. But um, first off, um, there is no issue or threats to users' funds. Um, there's no threat to users' privacy, but this could have been abused to pretty much just stall and stop coin join rounds from actually completing. So, um, you know, I, I think most of you should know this, but the way Zero Link works is you go connect and register your input and then have a blinded hash signed of the output that you want to register and then come back with that through a separate Tor circuit. The problem here is that for each denomination that can be in a Wasabi round, there is a different key um, to sign those outputs. And that's how you distinguish, um, you know, the, the different amounts now that they've started doing that. Um, but the problem is that the coordinator um, would reuse the same nonce for every signature on the same denominated amounts. So effectively, um, somebody who is able to register um, two outputs of the same value denomination uh, would be able to figure out the private key used to sign those blinded inputs. And effectively, um, two things could be done with this. Um, one, you register um, everything plus some faked outputs, in which case um, that transaction will not even be valid 
because the sum of the, the outputs would exceed the inputs. So say you put in 2.1s and 2.2s and then attempt to register an output for extra 0.2s. Um, that's just completely invalid. And in another case, um, you could play a similar game where you ensure that the inputs and output amounts um, are correct, which would, um, in theory, result in another member of the coin join um, losing money um, because you registering um, would pretty much take up an extra slot that prevented them from registering their output. But in reality, um, at the finalization of the round, their client, because their output was not in the transaction, um, would refuse to sign that transaction. And so the round would fail. So there's really no way that you could lose privacy or lose money because of this, but this could have been used to pretty much for free, just keep stalling um, coin join rounds so that they didn't actually happen. But this was patched um, in the recent backend update. And after I think it was 90 days, um, this was disclosed in May, uh, they've made their public disclosure. So, and also uh, just a shout out, I'm going to completely butcher this guy's fucking name. Um, Andres Vespustik uh, uh, from Trezor. Um, thank you for handling things like an adult. Mm -hmm. All right, and next up, uh, just a real quick update. But uh, Joseph Frank Abel um, from California, one of the people arrested last December in relation to the BitClub Ponzi scheme, has pled guilty um, to conspiracy to offer and sell unregistered securities, as well as um, filing a false tax return. And so independently, um, the unregistered securities um, solicitation and sales uh, have a maximum of five years in jail. And uh, the fraudulent tax return um, up to three. So he is looking at potentially eight years in jail right now, as well as um, fines going up to a few hundred thousand dollars and proportional to how much money he made in the scam. And I am going to be very shocked if uh, this does not lead to a, a domino with the rest of the people involved and, uh, you know, some information being attested to in, in a plea agreement here. But I do also, because I can't resist um, being a little snarkish here, that again, nowhere in this, uh, you know, announcement or, or court proceedings is anything about chain analysis mentioned. Yep. Almost like it wasn't relevant. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. W what do you got to drop on us this month? Alright, sorry, I was clicking around. Um, yes, so as I already mentioned, there is a another installment of the Bitcoin Privacy Newsletter that I've been doing since June. Uh, so this one was for the month of August, and as I said in the kind of blurb that I sent out to subscribers. It includes 14 stories spanning coin swaps, atomic swaps, sim swaps, pay nims, pay joins, dust attacks, and fully noted deep dives. And there's a table of contents at the beginning so you can pick what you want to read because it is a very long read. It's almost 30 minutes to read. Um, so they are quite long, but it is a whole month of content. And I also notice that um, already and Matt gave a shout out on TFTC, so thank you for that. Um, one thing that I think it was Matt who brought it up that he, he actually reads the newsletter as I'm building it throughout the month, and there's going to be a little change in that. I mean, I was already planning to do this just because um, if you if you can you know tell I'm building the newsletter on GitHub, and so basically every time I make a commit, um, a change is made, and that includes two newsletters for the current month that I haven't shared widely, but are still technically public. And so what I've done to kind of make the, um, the notification schedule a bit more clean, because obviously 
when I'm starting to write that month's newsletter, um, anyone who's subscribed to the RSS feed is basically getting pinged of like when I open the new document to write the newsletter. And so instead I have moved the newsletters that are in progress to a separate branch in my repo so that um, that way I can just merge in. <laughs> I can just merge in the um, finished newsletter once it's actually ready at the end of the month. Um, so technically it's still public. You just have to do one more extra click to change the branch in the repo if you want to read it on GitHub. Um, so it won't appear on the actual website until the end of the month as I have scheduled. So that's a little change just to make things cleaner, but it's still there if you want to do what Matt does and read it as I go along. Respect the time wall. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I've been um, kind of doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I see you guys poking around. Well, we can't help it. You know, it it's the autism. To be fair, I can't actually see what you're doing because GitHub doesn't really do analytics and I don't really want it to. So that's fine with me. <laughs> Alrighty, though. Speaking of autism, are you ready for some? Always. Always ready for the autism pejorative. <laughs> so Nadav Cohen um, has come up with a really awesome idea um and yeah uh, it's pretty much a a way to emulate l2 um for things on lightning right now um without l2 and now this does introduce a shift in trust model because a federation has to go um into the picture here to really handle this <clears throat> but that could probably be addressed um, by tweaking the, the spec to work on blinded signing so that a federation really has no clue what it's interacting with, um, kind of like some of the plans for state chains. But this is based on a concept called Smart Contracts Unchained by ZMNS uh, CPXJ um, to pretty much take all of the complicated logic in a smart contract and just lift it off chain um, with like a composable federated oracle and so the idea here is that you could pretty much use that kind of mechanism um, to do the same thing that l2 does um, in terms of having a guarantee that the current balance um, the valid one is what is confirmed on chain um, and not do any kind of uh, penalizing and so pretty much the idea here would be um, similar to a state chain. Um, you would kind of have this parallel um, chain of commitments to the transactions in the different states of a, a channel factory built with this, um, in addition to the actual pre-signed transactions themselves. And the idea here is that every um, commitment transaction and state update transaction that would actually fan things out into the individual balances um, would have one path where every member of the channel factory um, can spend after a CSV timeout. So that would be the commitment transaction hits chain. And then after the timeout, they could submit the state transaction for that. And then that would finalize and everyone would have their money. And the other path would be a subset of the um, channel members and this federation who is going to step in and kind of help emulate L2. And the idea here is that if an old commitment transaction or an old um, channel state transaction were to hit chain, both of those have this other path um, where less than the entire factory membership plus the Federation can sign things without a time lock. And the idea here is if this ever happens, um, somebody can go to the Federation, um, they can present the signed commitments um, of every state in the channel factory to prove the most recent one. 
And then the Federation would sign a transaction bypassing the time lock immediately and spending to a new commitment transaction um, of the most recent state. And the reason they do this is in case somebody were to trick the Federation, it's not sending money out immediately. It's just creating a new most recent commitment transaction. And if that were not the most recent one, that too has a path where people can go to the Federation and prove the current state. And pretty much the Federation here can create these new commitment transactions and these new channel state transactions um, with less than the entire channel factory and make new transactions on the fly um, that would guarantee the, the current valid balance is what happens on chain. And so, yes, there is absolutely the interjection of trust um, with the Federation here, but you can make that very redundant and have a lot of members involved in that. Um, but I'm just really excited about this because, hey, let's say we don't get any previous output. Um, let's say we don't get L2. Um, <clears throat> that would have meant channel factories aren't happening. But this is a way to allow them to actually function appropriately without L2 if, God forbid, um, we never actually get that functionality on Bitcoin. Alrighty, what's next? Something... So, um, last year, um, Bermuda began working on a blockchain-based digital ID system and also announced they would accept taxes paid in USDC. So they have kind of been um, dipping their toes in applying air quote crypto stuff um, as a very small island nation that can be flexible like that. And <clears throat> they are now um, partnering um, the, the government of Bermuda with a local uh, payments platform, Stablehouse and Blockstream to issue stimulus tokens um, on liquid and utilize that to kind of send out the helicopter money to help people cope with the giant clusterfuck that is now the global economy. And um, <clears throat> yeah, this is something, um, yeah. It was definitely a clusterfuck in most countries who did such payments, trying to get them out to everybody in a meaningful time um, and a logistical nightmare. But <clears throat> um, yeah, this is kind of crossing the, the line of it's probably going to get people used to this technology and some people will funnel into Bitcoin because of that. But, you know, this is a government system. And I would be very shocked if this did not utilize uh, the liquid securities platform, which is pretty much the little um, keep everything in a multi sig with the issuer so that they can whitelist and blacklist things. But <clears throat> the thing that really kind of bothers me here is. Bermuda is outright saying they have no intention of direct government involvement in the sense of a central bank digital currency, that the bank or, or the government would operate directly accessible to consumers. Um, they are specifically planning on continuing these kinds of pilot programs just with private companies, um, hence the, the group Stablehouse they're working with. And that is exactly how this type of stuff, in my opinion, will actually expand and be adopted, um, is to do it in a way that doesn't further implode the economy by trying to find a way for banks or other private entities to be involved in this. And they're even trying to consider um, banks specifically because this is just a payment processor they're working with right now um, and how to guarantee that they can still have a central role or role in an ecosystem like this um, 
as a deposit taking and kind of central part of a, such a system. So yeah, um, this is kind of the market, I guess, that the, the segment of Blockstream working on commercial products like Liquid is going for, but it still feels kind of icky to me. And uh, I'm not really sure that I'm going to like the consequences if things like this really do start taking hold and expanding to larger areas if this pilot program goes well. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if the day comes where I wind up being pushed into using things like this, I'm going to have the exact opposite um, experience <laughs> than I did when I first started interacting with Bitcoin. I'm not going to be in awe and shock and joy. I am going to be repulsed and disgusted. And uh, yeah. Same here. All right, and then I guess last up on my end. Um, so Bitthumb has supposedly um, been raided and seized by South Korean police. And really, I'm not sure what to make of the kind of underlying cause of this. Um, so it, it pretty much relates to a buyout um, from a Singapore based company that actually shares, um, or no, not that company directly, the parent company shares some executives and shareholders, um, with Bitthumb, um, who created an agreement to buy a majority share in Bitthumb and issued tokens, um, to represent value in that. And apparently, um, at the very end of the deal, um, because this Singapore company had been making installment payments essentially um, to Bitthumb, uh, they backed out of and did not make the final payment um, to finalize this deal. And based on that, the price of these tokens um, crashed <laughs> to zero. Um, somebody involved in a lawsuit with Bitthumb um, actually put in a million dollars and has barely over 10,000 right now um, in terms of the, the fiat value of those tokens. And so I'm not really sure here whether this is some legitimate financial issue with the Singapore company um, that led to them being unable to make that payment. If this is some really shady, uh, you know, kind of grifter scam that I'm not really seeing the angles of, but, you know, a, a number of major uh, publications in South Korea are talking about this. And also um, in the last week, uh, they have also seized the exchange um, Coinbit as well. Um, <laughs> for allegedly inflating their trading volumes by 99%. So they're being accused of literally only 1% of their volume um, being legitimate volume. So, um, yeah. I am... Um, let's just say that there is a culture of degenerate gambling in that country and i feel like things like this are the consequences of that finally coming home to roost and the big question i really have is how are south korean regulators going to respond to this because all things given aside from the usual cough up your uh, identifying information and bend over um south korea has been pretty friendly and attempting in most of their decisions to work with the industry in the country. So I kind of want to see if these events are going to lead to a big attitude shift there. Yeah, that is a lot of action in a short time. And that generally leads to politicians and bureaucrats having to get on a podium and spin a narrative in response to it. All right, though. Uh, what do you got to take us out on? Well, as I said at the start of 
of the show. This is going to be a big for the Assange case because the main part of the extradition hearings are finally starting uh, more than a year after he was originally arrested in London. And the good news is that his fiancée, Stella, has managed to raise over £100,000 in crowdfund pledges in basically just a few weeks, which is pretty cool. It just reached uh, £100,000 in pledges just today. And on the same day, there was also an interview published with her from the Sunday, I think it's Sunday Times Magazine, um, and she's given a few interviews before. There's like a, a 60 minute show that is basically about her and Julian Assange and their relationship and the case that was published previously. But this interview is quite interesting because um, it's literally getting published right before the start of the hearings, which by the time you hear this will basically be happening on the day of. Um, but uh, it's a really good interview. I recommend it. If you can't uh, get past the paywall, um, just go to archive.is. And yeah, it's basically she just talks about how she met him and some of the stuff they've had to deal with, um, especially having two sons in the meantime. And she's basically going to be, you know, pleading with the UK justice system to not take away the father of her children. There's a portion in the interview where she says, for Julian, extradition will be a death sentence. For the rest of our family, it means something not far from it. My children will be fatherless and I will lose the man I love forever. Even now, I don't know whether my children will ever be held in their father's arms again. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of people who, I mean, there's a lot of people who just don't know very much about the case in general. They just kind of no, oh, Julian Assange is the or is or was the editor in chief of WikiLeaks, which you know publishes documents and stuff, but they don't really think of the fact that you know even besides Stella, you know he has a father who is fighting to get him out of prison and at least keep him away from the United States. He also has a mother and he has children from previous relationships and he has this fiance and two sons who are very young. Um, And basically one of them, um, as she says in the interview, he actually met one of his sons for the first time while he was in Belmarsh because um, due to the extreme conditions that he was being put under while he was still in the Ecuadorian embassy, Um, so literally one of the kids has only ever known him through, you know, Belmarsh prison meeting rooms. And if we, you know, if we don't fight for him in this extradition case, then that may be the only time that he ever knows him. So if you, especially if you're in the UK, if you donate to the crowdfund, it's still open, I think at this point, um, but it has obviously reach the end goal so um just be aware in the coming week that there's going to be a lot of news coming out and there's a lot at stake here Mm -hmm. and beyond just his family too um this is going to be a very big social precedent in terms of how journalism is perceived Yeah, um, that's definitely going to be a big aspect of the case because obviously the U.S. prosecution, though they don't state it directly in either the old indictment or the new indictment, which uh, to be honest shouldn't even be accepted because it was submitted past deadline for doing so, and they basically just submitted a bunch of new information that not only have the lawyers not been given enough time to go through it, but Assange himself has literally not seen the evidence for his own case. Like, this whole case, this trial, should be thrown out just on the basis of there has been no due process. This is not normal. If you bring in the conflicts of interest with the judge herself, um, the judge who is not the main judge but selected the main judge and is still technically involved in the case as kind of like a supervisor, um, this case should be thrown out on those points alone. Like the idea that someone would come to, you know, whether it's a full trial or it's just an extradition hearing, the idea that someone would face that 
and potentially face decades in prison and not even have a chance to talk to his own lawyers, uh, which he has not been able to in the last six months. That is insane. Um, it should be thrown out on that basis. But then there's the other question of the U.S. prosecution basically arguing through implication that what he did was not journalism because he communicated with hackers or he published confidential documents or he may have encouraged a source to give him confidential documents all of these things are things that multiple dozens of other journalists have done and have not been prosecuted in any way for doing they continue to do stuff like this of course the reason that he's being prosecuted is because he actually published something that affected the world and they hate that and we should not allow them to take someone like that away because that's just going to set the stage for more prosecutions on much lesser known journalists, um, prevent ones who could do similar things from doing so in the future out of fear. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the point. All right, you know, I guess uh, final thoughts time. Uh, well, that was my final thought, but I can find something else. Find more thought. I guess while you're doing that, um, you know, I, uh, blah. I spoke at the Plebsec uh, Security Congress that Karu Zagaris threw um, yesterday and gave a talk on the nature of scalability and regulatory uh, capture as far as the entire system of Bitcoin goes. So I would highly recommend um, anybody listening to this, uh, go pop over and give that a listen to and uh, check out some of the other thoughts because on the whole, um, it's pretty widespread um, topics relevant to dealing with the gauntlet that the next few years are probably going to be, um, just in general. So a uh, big shout out to Karu for throwing that and everybody um, head over there and start thinking adversarially because we are not invincible. Yeah, I listened to a big portion of that. I was not able to actually be a speaker because I was too busy. But um, one comment that particularly uh, I found funny it was during the conversation about citadels and I tweeted out someone said I take back everything I said about citadels let's build a space station which was really funny because that was at the end of a conversation about how citadels may not actually be practical or how they can you know not turn out so great um, so for someone to suggest that we build a space station <laughs> instead was quite good gotta take this shit seriously but yeah oh i have another thing so bisk on september 4th um they tweeted out that they are finally going to get segwit support holy shit finally it's not here yet they kind of, i think they said it would still take a few weeks to a few months but they kind of just laid out how they've been you know working on getting that done so it is going to happen uh, so that's good news. Yes, things like BISC need to concentrate on every little scrap of scalability that they can, or people are just going to sign right up with Coinbase. Alrighty, though, so, uh, yeah. Oh, and we didn't mention the giant elephant room, which is that NSA Dragnet telephone record surveillance has been ruled illegal. Yay. <laughs> How could I forget that? And out of the same court district that Mr. Roof Korean protected your right for very big gun magazines in. Yes, that appears to be the case. Even more interesting is that um, Edward Snowden was not, uh, cited in the ruling. You know, that guy that uh, WikiLeaks helped to uh, keep out of uh, U.S. prison or worse? That guy, he was cited in the ruling about how it's illegal. The thing that he exposed. 
Oh, I would love to see the Ninth Circuit just start making a bunch of uppity rulings that either have to stand or go up to the Supreme Court. Alrighty, though. We got any more thoughts, or is that a wrap? I think that is a wrap. Alrighty, Ooh, then. NSA. We hate Fuck you. the NSA. Go die. Peace, punks. Bye. Hey, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>